Okay, well, thank you, Ivan. Um, can you confirm that you hear me and see my screen? Yes. Okay, that's become the standard question these days. <laughs> um, it's tough to follow such great presentations, but I'm Chris Shearer. I'm an associate professor at the South Dakota School of Mines and Technology. And unfortunately, we're battling a wildfire right at the fringe of town that's already destroyed a few of houses. So um, we have a different type of unconventional fly ash in the air currently, but hopefully that'll be um, under control soon. I give thanks to my um, PhD student, Jetson Ty Thinley, for this, some of this research, and then my colleagues on this project um, at Ohio State University of Miami and University of Toronto is listed. And so I'm going to be introducing our um, NCHRP project, which is testing marginal and unconventional fly ashes and you know, rewriting the specification for them. Um, specifically, I'm going to be talking about some durability testing, but we didn't get quite as much finished as we thought we would before this. So um, I've shifted the focus a little bit. So as you've heard um, quite a few times today, you know, over the recent past, the amount of high quality specification meeting fly ash produced has steadily decreased while consumption has really remained constant or slightly increased. And so, you know, as a result, the percentage of fly ash consumed has steadily increased as shown on this plot by the ACAA. I'm not gonna go into too much detail because I think, you know, Tom did an excellent job of explaining all the intricacies and nuances of that. But um, due to a number of factors in the future, it is possible you know, that fly ash production could dip below market demand. Um, and so there's really, really a need to be able to find other sources of fly ash to meet this demand, whether that's location specific or otherwise. And these sources, they may come from ponds or landfills or from marginal and unconventional sources that have been beneficiated um, with or, with, or, or used without processing. And so, um, there are a lot of conflicting definitions for these ash sources. And I'd like to begin by setting our own defini definitions as listed down here at the bottom. Um, and these are up for debate as, as the research in this area continues to evolve, but alternative fly ashes we're defining as this whole subset of ashes, marginal, unconventional, or beneficiated. So a marginal ash, um, we consider it to be an ash sort of on the fringe of the specification, but not necessarily off spec. So you might consider it lower quality or maybe it's not lower quality. It just has um, a specific uh, parameter or characteristic that makes it um, to be on the fringe. An unconventional source um, fly ash, um, we heard the reasoning today why these are called harvested ashes if they're coming from ponds or landfills. Um, for le at least legal purposes, um, although I still hear the word reclaimed very often. So maybe we should be more careful as an industry in, in terms of what we're calling these ashes. Um, and I think there maybe should be some more standardization of what the name should be. Um, and these unconventional sources, although they can be from landfills, they can also be like bottom ashes like Cole just talked about or CFB ashes. And um, now these unconventional and marginal source ashes can be on spec, meaning meeting specifications or off spec, it, it doesn't, um, you know, mean one or the other. So, um, you know, this particular project, uh, oh, lastly here, we have beneficiated, which is where we're taking one of these sources, treating it to meet the specification. So this project funded by NCHRP um, is looking at recommendations to revise AASHTO M295. And anytime I say M295, you can kind of stick in, you know, C618. Um, they're the complementary standards with very, um, you know, small changes between the two. And the, the second, um, goal of this project is to develop a guide for DOTs to use off-spec ashes um, if the reason that they are off-spec, for example, having a high LOI, is not really of concern for their use. So just to go into a bit more detail, um, starting from the left to the right of this slide, you know, recent changes in manufacturing for environmental reasons um, mostly has resulted in the production of, of marginal fly ashes. So for example, dry sorbent sorbent injection or changes in firing conditions. 
And so some detailed changes I could talk about it here are in, um, limestone injection, so for control and capture of, of sulfate um, gas emissions, and that can result in increased calcium and sulfate contents, which may Im impact durability performance. You have the injection of activated carbon, which was talked about in an earlier presentation, um, and that is for mercury capture. That can result in not only higher LOI or different LOI, but different um, carbon properties. Um, and that can affect, you know, air entrainment absorption, other admixture absorption and freeze-thaw performance. And then there's lots of other processes that can change certain deleterious components in the ashes listed. Now, unconventional ashes from the disposal in, in ponds and landfills, or we have CFB ashes or bottom ashes here, there's some potential that they have higher variability just in the way that they are disposed or harvested. But luckily, as you know, there has been a lot of good research and developments in this area. And then treatment is often times needed to bring these marginal and unconventional ashes into compliance with the current specifications. And these might be called the remediated or beneficiated ashes. Um, generally, this treatment is used to change LOI or fineness, but we know there's lots of other types that can be used as listed over here on the right. Um, and we'll go into a little bit more detail of this uh, a little bit later. So in terms of the ashes that we've um, collected for this particular project, we have 22 different ashes, seven that are conventional, but they have quite a, a wide range of compositions, including both C and F ashes, and then 15 marginal and unconventional ashes. I know the numbers underneath don't match up because some of the ashes fall under multiple categories, but um, we have seven different beneficiated ashes, four um, from unconventional sources, and then six so-called extreme property ashes where they have a really high value of a certain property and then these so-called other ashes. And we're even testing a bottom ash blend that's a mix of fly ash and bottom ash, you know, coming from Canada. So, you know, we believe um, as a project team that there's a need to modernize the standard to really better reflect the impact fly ash has on concrete properties. And I've listed the, the limits for 295 here, but of course it's applicable to 618 as well. And, um, I'll only highlight a few of these, but but please reference the journal article at the written at the bottom of this slide if you want more information. Um, in this project, we're really focusing on three primary issues we see with the current standard, and that's first of all LOI, um, and that's because there's lot, been lots of research that shows LOI doesn't really correlate well with adsorption, which is a real performance issue that we're trying to deal with. So there's been lots of suggestions about what's a better way to measure this in term, instead of LOI, um, but there hasn't been general consensus, I guess, in terms of what should be included, if any, in a specification. And so um, we're look, doing quite a bit of research in that um, area, which of course is directly related to durability. Um, and then another topic we focused on is SAI, um, Strength Activity Index, and um, Pranoid gave an excellent presentation this morning of some of his suggestions. But there's lots of different ways to measure um, reactivity, and there's um, many reasons why SAI does not necessarily correlate with reactivity. So what, what eventually makes it into the standard probably has to be readily implementable, um, pretty easy to perform. And so um, there's, there's high level ways to measure reactivity and low level ways. And so we're exploring all these different um, opportunities. And then down here we have um, uniformity. And so the current uniformity assessments are, are, we don't know if they're really capturing the true variability of all of these marginal and unconventional ashes. And perhaps there's a better way to assess uniformity. Um, you know, how often you test it and in terms of a, a statistical analysis on the uniformity, um, perhaps it may be better to specify uniformity as a fly ash property that actually directly affects concrete performance like adsorption or reactivity instead of, you know, just fineness, which is, of course, an, an easy thing to measure. You know, some of the other things we have listed on here, I'm not going to go into um, too much detail on them, but, you know, some of oxides, yes, it gives us an indication that this is a flash and not some just random powder material, but is that truly linked to performance? 
SO3, we saw an excellent presentation this morning. Um, you know, you can, you can limit the percent, but it's really the phases that are present that affect the performance. And so in general, we can do a better job um, in actually predicting how a fly ash will behave in, in concrete than we currently are. Um, and so here's a list. I know this is one of these slides where you, your eyes just glaze over immediately because there's too many numbers, but I'm not going to spend too much time on here. Um, but these are um, a majority of the samples we've collected, not all of them. And we've binned them into three um, different uh, categories. So we have the standard ashes, which are so-called in-spec ashes at the top. We have beneficiated ashes in the middle. And we've really tried to capture the current um, commercial, all of the com current commercial technologies that are being used to beneficiate ashes. Um, and we know that this is continually changing. And so our matrix has continually changed as we've gone through this project. But, you know, if you see another type of beneficiation that we, you really think we're missing, you know, we may consider including it. And then we have our marginal and un unconventional ashes down here at the bottom including high SO3 ashes, ashes that don't meet fineness requirements, and some that are, are currently not listed. So um, in terms of um, their properties, anything that's highlighted in yellow is something that's marginal, close to the limit, and then red is outside of a limit. And you can see we have quite a distribution of different properties. Um, I'm not going to go into all the details here, but um, we're you know, testing these all of these ashes with a, a very large suite of um, you know, characteristic, or characteristic property testing and also um, paste testing, mortar testing and concrete testing. So we should get a lot of, of good data to present back to NCHRP and hopefully back to the DOTs. As a subset of all of that testing that I just listed, um, we're just gonna present a, a, some data here from, from some of the mortar testing that we've done um, and uh, we've done water demand, the SAI, infamous SAI, bulk resistivity, and then the durability component <laughs> of this presentation, sulfate attack. Um, and so although durability assessments are considered optional in the fly ash specifications, uh, many times we know fly ash is used to improve durability of concrete. And so, you know, I think it's warranted that we do test durability of these, of these ashes. So let's look at the SAI data. Um, you know, the controls here over on the left, we have a lot of samples and I'm not going to go into the details of each one, but what I can say is that all of the, all of the ashes, whether they were in spec, out of spec, uh, marginal, unconventional, beneficiated, they all did meet SAI, which is not, perhaps not a shocking um, finding, but um, it just goes to show once again that perhaps SAI is not capturing everything that's going on here. Um, the 28 and seven day data is shown um, in blue and or in green and yellow. And I apologize if you're colorblind. Um, and then on the right, we have 91 day in purple. And you can see that the differentiation um, in performance compared to the control is much more um, distinct at, at the 91 day um, limit. There was only one sample, which is a beneficiated harvested ash that was sort of marginal at, at one of the ages, but it technically still did meet SAI. Um, water requirement is over here to the right, and um, the majority of the samples also met this, except for the CFB ash and that same beneficiated harvested ash. And so, um, you know, I think this is, is a good data for showing that a lot of these ashes um, can meet at least portion of the, the current specification. But we know we can do better in terms of the specification um, in classifying and, and figuring out if these ashes are good for concrete or bad for concrete. So um, uh, as Pernoy pointed out earlier today, um, many inert materials can pass as reactive using the SAI. So we also measured these same samples, which are, you know, the water cement ratio is not constant or water cementitious ratio because it's based on flow. So we're using those samples here for bulk resistivity up to 91 days. And you can really see there is greater variability in the data and the distinction between the ashes with some of the ashes performing better and some com performing worse compared to our SAI data. And if I take this bulk resistivity data and I normalize it at each age to the control, um, you can see that that some of the ashes perform better in this metric compared to others, especially at later ages. 
um, you know, after the reaction of the ashes has occurred. So we're really analyzing this data and diving into it to look at correlations with ash properties and other um, characteristics. But we really think that bulk resistivity is sort of an exciting um, measurement to be able to assess reactivity. We probably have to change the, the design of the mix and, you know, curing, as Pernoy had mentioned, um, because we see greater or starker differences at higher percentages of fly ash replacement and higher temperature curing um, compared to what we, sh what we show here. So um, if you plot the 28 and 91 day bulk resistivity data and the SAI data, you see the just general variability in the ash performance. There's no really strong correlation um, compared to the cement control for both of these two measurement types. And especially at, at later ages, um, if we look at the 91 day plot over here on the right, you can see that all of the ashes perform better than the control with respect to S the SAI, but that's not necessarily the case for the bulk resistivity. So we're gonna need some more time to look into this data to fully explain it, but it really shows um, that they are capturing some different um, things going on inside the, the mortars. So finally, we're getting to um, some durability testing, um, which is sulfate attack measured by um, C1012. And um, the control cement here is drawn right down the middle as a solid black line. Um, and the optional spec limits in the standards are at 0.05% and 0.1% at six months are drawn here as well. And you can see the testing is still ongoing. Um, we know how long and <laughs> laborious this test is, um, but, the, but we can see that many of the ashes are performing well. Um, and a set of the ashes also had very high sulfate expansion at early ages. But as we can see, a lot of these are the usual suspects for bad sulfate performance, including high calcium oxide content, high SO3 content um, as shown. And if we dive into the data a little bit more, um, we, can, we can see there's a slight correlation for, with calcium oxide content and sulfate expansion as shown here, at least for the samples that we tested out to this age. But although it's known that calcium oxide content uh, or high calcium ox fly ashes are more susceptible to sulfate attack in general, the sulfate attack performance is likely more related um, to more complex things like the availability of aluminum and sulfur, and that's supplied by both the amorphous and crystalline phases in the ashes. And that can be difficult to predict using just, you know, standard analytical measurements um, because high calcium ashes do favor the, the formation of calcium aluminate hydrates and monosulfate instead of etronite, and that makes them more um, susceptible to sulfate attack. But here listed at the bottom, I've kind of outlined the, the ashes that didn't perform well so far. And we see some of them are in spec and some are out of spec. Um, and so some of them have high C3A contents as well as anhydrite, which we know um, reacts with water to form gypsum. And one of our out, really out of spec ashes with a, a seven, almost 18% SO3 content had gypsum, bacinite and arcanite in it from um, QXRD. And so, um, you know, we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit more in the conclusion slide, but it just goes to highlight that um, along similar to conventional ashes, um, marginal and unconventional ashes can also perform well or perform poorly with sulfate attack. So in summary, um, they all passed the SAI, um, but some had um, elevated water requirements bulk resistivity seem to show more greater variability. We know there's a better way to measure reactivity and we're currently working on that. And compared to the cement control, a lot of the class C fly ashes and high SO3 ashes performed poor, poorly in sulfate attack. Um, and, but many of these common indicators of poor performance that were used for traditional fly ashes also apply to these other types of ashes such as high calcium. And so um, if we know that an ash does not perform well, It'll need to be you know, tested prior to use, just like it is done now. But that doesn't mean that these ashes can't be used in concrete if sulfate you know, resistance is not needed. So we have a lot more data to analyze, but this is just a little bit of a flavor of, of what we've done so far. Thank you to NCHRP um, for, for funding and then our fly ash producers for contributing all of the, the ashes. And all of us in our labs have so much ash, we don't know what to do with it. <laughs> it's just everywhere. Um, and I uh, thank you for 
uh, listening to me. Here's a picture my friend took a couple of months ago of the um, needles in the Black Hills of South Dakota. And I like to call this nature's concrete. It's quite beautiful. Thanks.